My name is John Crichton. My name is John Crichton. My name is John Crichton. Look upward and share the wonders I've seen. Your plan? Always have been, John. Why does it bother you? No, it doesn't bother me. I just never suspected. You're a vegetable. Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of the Scapecast, your guide to the wonders of Farscape. I'm your co host, Lindy Ray. And I'm back. This is Kimberly Thompson sitting in Kevin's virtual chair this week while he's at Dragon Con having fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, on this episode of the Scapecast, we're going to have. We're going to have part two of the John Crichton character review. The Nabari murder mystery. And we'll have all our regular features like trivia, news, and the question of the week. And the coolest thing, a special interview with Gigi Edgley, our own Chiana. This show's spoiler level is... Season 2. Well, everybody, we're here in the Scapecast virtual studios, and on the phone with Kimberly and me is our own Kevin Batchelder and Kurt Armbruster because they have something really exciting to tell us. So, guys, what's going on at Dragonton? Well, you got all kinds of fun things going on here, Lindy. And, uh, you know, I know we promised I wouldn't be on this week's episode, but this is just too good. I couldn't pass up the chance for Kurt and I to jump in here. As we've mentioned on the previous cast, one of the items happening here at DragonCon was the Parsec Awards, which was the excellence in science fiction podcasting. And as we've mentioned, we were nominated in the best fan category, and we actually won. We won? We won. won. Yay! (laughs) Yay! That is so awesome! So did they just have the ceremonies? Yeah, the ceremonies were held uh, earlier in the evening in, uh, you know, several categories. And, And as I mentioned, ours in the best fan podcast we were nominated against several other excellent shows yeah it was very stiff competition so we were you know quite amazed i must say when they opened the envelope and and read the name you know kurt and i kind of looked at each other and then <laughs> had to go up on stage we weren't quite sure what to do well kurt how does it feel to have to go accept an award like this my, my jaw is still on the floor <laughs> um we, we were up against two of my favorite fo- favorite podcasts and you know, I'm I'm still just amazed and flabbergasted uh, that they read our name. And and Kevin, how about you? Did, you had to go up there. What did you What did you say? Uh, it was very short and sweet. I think I just uh, thanked uh, uh, the judges. Sam, I thank our fans and the listeners for you know the reason that we're out there, and and I just thanked the list of crew members. And that was about it. I was just too dumbstruck to do much else. I actually started to walk away from the podium and forgot to take the award. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you almost left the award on the podium. So, Kurt, did you get to say anything? Uh, I, I pretty much said thank you, and that, that's what it sort of sweet. Well, is there anyone else that you two would like to thank now that you have a little more composure and some time? Yeah, we should probably thank those people over at the Tim Henson Company for making a certain series called Farscape, because without them, there wouldn't be enough. I completely agree. The other thing, Lindy, we should definitely thank is, um, since this was, you know, everyone knows how hard it is getting things off the ground, but the folks who were the Parsec Awards Committee who actually, um, you know, got the idea together and the formation and the judges and everything, we should give them a quick shout-out, too. The the three people involved there were um, the well-known author, Tracy Hickman, uh, Mer Lafferty, who's well-known on her podcast, and also uh, Michael R. Menenge, who's very involved with Farpoint Media. So thank you to those folks for putting a lot of time and effort into setting this thing up and also for hosting those first awards. Oh, yeah. And I'll, I'll get back to where I was and say thanks so much to Kurt and Kevin for calling in and uh, having us talk to you for Episode 11 of the Skatecast. And I hope you guys continue to enjoy the Dragon Con, and we'll see you for Episode 12. <laughs> well, goodbye, everyone. Um, calling live from... Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia. This is Kevin, and uh, I'm looking forward to being back more involved in the next episode of the Escape Cast, and maybe by then I'll actually be walking on the ground instead of floating. Now, we've had some really nasty voicemails this week from Ema and her friends. Why don't you have a listen to this? Doggo, you should study this. L-M-N-O-P Q. Just a few of their words, just in case. Hello? Is this thing working? <clears throat> okay. My name is Ema, and I am calling to complain about...
about a recent episode of Trout Talk. My mother says that my name does not mean what you said it means. In fact, she said you are all a bunch of probactos and should know better than to make personal comments about someone else's name. Only real probactos would behave like that. My mother says that my name is perfectly fine for me, and just so you remember, Emma's a name that makes people want to pinch my cheeks. You are just jealous because you don't have such a drag name. So there. Mr. Hoople here. Look, I know you are only trying to educate the public, and as a citizen of the uncharted territories, I have to respect that. But only a probacto would keep picking on that little red kid. She has the whole ship in an uproar. Tell the universe Ema means something nice and let the rest of us have some peace. Is that too much to ask? This is Orville the Slightly Annoyed. What do you mean about upsetting that Ema kid? Don't you know that she's getting everyone riled up? What probactos would get her so upset that she disturbs the peace of everyone else? I don't even know what her problem is, but I've heard enough to blame you. Now stop it. Hello, Scapecast. Nuki Monster here. Ema wanted me to call you and complain about something. Uh, yeah, she told me what it was, but I did not hear her. Nom, 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 nom. Uh, but whatever the problem is, the answer is Lumas. Thank you for listening. Hello? Hello? Uh, this is Dr. Ernestine Spam here. And I just want to let you know that Ema is quite upset by this whole name episode. So you had better straighten up before Rigel the 16th Dharmanar of, oh, who cares, starts really throwing that probacto name around when he speaks about the scape cast. You know, probacto means son of a, son of a, son of a gun. I found it in the Farscape Encyclopedia on the internet thingy. Picking on a small child, you need to get your heads out of your Ema's, uh, oh, or, uh, well, just, just wait till I talk to Commander Hogthrob about this. Goodbye. Man, I sure don't want to be crossing that email the wrong way, or any of her friends. No. Arr. <laughs> Howdy, I'm Brent Barrett, and it's time for your Farscape trivia question. You know the peacekeeper symbol that features a red triangle poking through a circle? It's on all their stuff. Still don't remember it? Well, remember that mat Aaron falls on when Metala knocks her out and back and back and back to the future? Yeah, that symbol. As with a lot of works of fiction, the Farscape folks borrowed an actual icon from human history for that symbol. Do you know what actual human icon is represented by that red triangle piercing that circle? Stay tuned for the answer later in the show. Hey everyone, this is Kevin. I know Lindy and Kim mentioned I wasn't going to be on this show because I'm at Dragon Con, but I kind of fooled them here and recorded this a little earlier for you. If you're looking for ways to contact the Scapecast, we've got several. Whatever uh, makes it easy for you, we don't mind at all. We'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at feedback at scapecast.org. You can also go to our website at scapecast.org and click on the forums option to go right there and leave it in our forums. You can also call us wherever the idea might strike you. That phone number is 206-350-6692. And if you'd like to, you can even record a message for us right from our website. No need for a phone call. You'll see a button that says, Talk to us now. If you have a microphone on your computer, you can click there, and that'll walk you right through being able to leave us a recorded message. And finally, also on our website, top right corner of the page, you'll see a link that says, Contact Scapecast. That's an easy way, if you don't have your email program handy, that you can send us a private message right to us as well. So whichever option works for you, we'd love to hear from you. Our next segment is part two of The Hero Next Door, or how John Crichton stopped worrying and learned to love leather, wormholes, and imaginary friends. And it's written by our own Wendy Hembrock. Once upon a time, there was a boy named John. 
One day, when John was out doing astronaut things, a big blue wormhole gobbled him up and spat him out at the far end of the universe. Things were looking grim in Mudville, till our hero met the amazing living ship, made some nice new friends, and he hooked up with his dream girl. We could have lived happily ever after, but the peacekeepers raped, chased, and tortured us for years on end. Previously on The Hero's Journey, John Crichton had just faked his way onto Scorpius's gamic base, entering the monomyth step called the Belly of the Whale. He's crossed the magic threshold and been swallowed into the unknown sphere of rebirth. Here lay monsters and psychological struggles. Entering the Belly of the Whale starts Phase 2, Initiation, where the hero's consciousness is transformed by facing a road of trials. Some things will be lost or die along the way. The trials are designed to see whether the protagonist really is the hero. Does he have the courage, the knowledge, the capacity to serve the call? The protagonist must quit thinking only of himself and his self-preservation to make the transformation of consciousness. Oh, you have got to be kidding. Tell me there is some kind of sick punchline coming. Unfortunately, John, it's true. Great. Absolutely great. The initiation is what puts the ass-kicking into all the action movies. In John Crichton's case, he's frelled. Psychologically symbolic moments occur during the trials. Two of these symbolic initiation steps recur in Farscape. The first type is called meeting with the goddess, where male and female resolve their tomato-tomato issues. Jelena is a notable goddess type, since she is the first alien John kisses, and the first with whom he acts on his desires. The second symbolic step is called atonement with the father, where fathers and sons arm wrestle for king of the hill. There's a lot more psychobabble involved with these two steps, but we'll save that for season two. Suffice it to say, many female characters take on symbolic actions that are meetings with the goddess, and Crichton makes noteworthy progress with his daddy issues in season one. During the trials, the protagonist finds new allies and enemies, and more archetypal characters. He's covertly aided by the advice, amulets, and the supernatural aid of the threshold guardians he met earlier in the departure phase. When Crichton leaves for the Gamic base, he has one amulet boon, the ident chip from Larak, a fake peacekeeper accent, and an unreliable ally in Chiana. He stumbles over the first low hurdles with their lucky charm, and then another ally reappears, John's old flame, Jelena. John. Jelena, what are you doing here? Is Christ here? No. I've been assigned to a new development project here. How would you know I was here? I saw you in the officer's lounge, wearing that uniform. I knew you'd never pass a genetic scan, so I overrode the security program. During the initiation, the protagonist's consciousness is transformed by the trials, or by illuminating revelations during the trials. In Season 1, the revelation is that Ancient Jack gave him hidden wormhole knowledge. These equations are necessary for creating a wormhole. You cannot access this data consciously. We will not give you wormhole technology. If you're not smart enough to discover it on your own, you're not smart enough to handle it wisely. You'll have to find it yourself. The unconscious knowledge we've given you will guide you. Nothing more. You are already on the right path. At first, the protagonist seems unable to meet the challenges. The trials continue building up to the big one, the ordeal. Now the hero must confront his dark self, fight the bad guy, or change his heart. Sometimes the death occurs of a friend or foe. Crichton must face the ordeal with the experience he's gained thus far. As with the Maldus game earlier, Crichton is again in a suspended mental state when Scorpius probes his mind in the Aurora chair. And again, the only tool he has to fight with is his mind. What the hell was that? A memory. Random and indistinct at the moment. It will take some time to map your neural patterns. You stayed the hell out of my mind, you freak. With Jelena and Chiana's help, the mission to get healing medicine for Aaron was accomplished. The relative ease with which he accomplished that deed acknowledges that Jonas progressed, 
But that was just one of many trials. Stop resisting the Aurora chair. Allow us to probe freely for any information we wish. It's not a very good option. You are not in a very good position. Fetch the comfy chair. The ordeal is a crucible where the character is annihilated and transformed. Crichton's torture in the comfy chair is his greatest ordeal in season one. His mind is sliced apart and invaded when Scorpius gets his own call to adventure by stumbling into these wormhole equations. Crichton survives the torture with the help of Jelena and Stark. Jelena acts as a nurturing goddess, offering a promise of life. Jelena was the first alien female John kissed, and she made him laugh. She gave a brief and naive glimpse of symbolic bliss. But Crichton's got no time for Jelena or her feelings when they meet again. Stark acts as a medicine man, the one who has appeased the dead and faced the depths of the underworld already. Stark's been where John has not yet gone. Stark has submitted to over two cycles in the Aurora chair, and can serve as guide and mentor to John as he faces the ordeal. By glimpsing Stark's thoughts, John holds on to a piece of his mind and hides the memory of the kiss long enough for Jelena to sabotage the chair with the false memories of Kreis. After the ordeal, there is a moment called Seize the Sword, where the protagonist sees the whole situation and then takes action. The big picture develops for the protagonist in relation to himself and others. He sees how the goal can be accomplished and is ready to act. Crichton's Seize the Sword moment comes when he uses the Aurora Chair, the tool of his torture, to turn the tables on Crace and Scorpius. Jelena has created the false memories, and Crichton seizes upon them to discredit Crace. The diversion gives John a reprieve to live until Aaron, Zahn, and Dargo can rescue him. On the Gamic base, Crichton met his real nemesis, Scorpius, got elixir for Aaron, dealt a major blow to Crace, and lived to make his getaway. In the process, he got Jelena mortally wounded. John and his friends return home to Moya, changed. Of course, the hero's journey continues to the next step, the chase, as Scorpion and Crace are still hunting them, leading to a further step, the showdown. In hidden memory... Crichton and Scorpius have a minor showdown during the escape, when Scorpius recaptures Crichton for a moment and shoots Jelena. The comfy chair ordeal has changed Crichton, and that experience will aid him in the next showdown. The ordeal also resulted in learning of the secret boon from ancient Jack. It's the key to succeeding at his deed, make a wormhole to get back home. The boon gives John a shred of hope, but his boon may be a double-edged sword, Boons often seem to be gold that turns to ashes. And the ordeal cost him Jelena. But Jelena, on her own hero's path, dies after accomplishing her daring deeds and gets her boon, the blissful promise of love before she dies. John. Yeah? Do you think if things had been different, then you could have loved It's unclear if Crichton was sincere, but with Jelena's death, he's reached another point along the larger initiation path as an ally dies to save him. The flight from the Gamic base leads to the big seize the sword moment of season one. Crichton realizes he must go with the shuttle and commits to the suicide mission to blow up the oil covered moon. I will not be taken alive. I've been in the goddamn chair and I am not going back in it. The smaller ship Crates and Scorpius will send can overpower us effortlessly. Okay, what do we see? Rigel flew that transport right into their ship. But what if one of us did the same thing, but at the last second veered off straight into the bridge? A Trojan horse. Won't cripple their operations. And what if the transport is loaded down with explosives? What if we blow the holy hell out of their nerve center? Would that buy us enough time for the rest of us to get away? Crichton fears recapture and more torture. He will give his life for the crew and to stop Scorpius. The recognition of what must be done propels events to the next step in the monomyth, the showdown, where the hero confronts a nemesis or accomplishes another deed. Before the suicide mission, Crichton returns to his earth amulet and his helpers yet again. He records a message for his father, 
Then Crichton gives the puzzle ring, the supernatural aid from his father, to his friend Dargo before they head out into space. The ring is part of that psychological moment of initiation, called Atonement with the Father. Sharing this artifact with Dargo marks Crichton's transition. He's transcended needing the ring and can give it to another. Dargo seemingly dies and loses the ring. That's a kind of spiritual death, but also the possibility of rebirth. Crichton moves further along the initiation into the new world he's in, and further away from his old world. With the loss of the ring, something in Crichton is gone, but something has been found in its place. He acknowledges this in the message he records for his father. It's a further step in Crichton's growth as a man in his own right. One other thing, Dad. You remember the day I left? You told me that every man has a chance to be his own kind of hero. Well, I don't think I'm ever coming home, so I won't get that ticker tape parade and... Doubt that I'm ever going to have kids, so I won't get a chance to be a hero to them. But I think I know what you meant. I've got a strange life here, Dad. It's different, but it's my own. I have people who rely on me. People who I care about. People who mystify me. And people who become allies. Friends. And people who teach me patience. And people who teach me other things. Well, you said the time had come, and I think it has. I have a job to do. And I am unafraid. That's what you said when they asked you what it was like to walk on the moon. You did good, Dad. You taught me well. This is John Crichton. Somewhere in the universe. Crichton and Dargo face the showdown and blow up the moon and save Moya and Talon from Scorpius. But they aren't finished. It's uncertain whether John and Dargo will live, or Aaron, or if they will have a reunion with the others on Moya. Everyone is in peril at the end of season one. The last stage of the hero's journey, the return, is what answers these cliffhanger questions. The return is where the protagonist must take his new revelation back home and share the message with those in the old world. The return happens in the episode Mind the Baby. After they blow up the moon, he just wants to get back to Moya. He brings back the revelatory knowledge about the wormhole equations and the hidden clone as part of the return. Another important symbolic change occurred in Crichton along his hero's journey. He's gone from being the thing living in fear and desire to be the thing desired and feared. He's the unique and special winner-take-all wormhole guy now. What that means for John and the crew becomes apparent in the rest of Season 2. Crichton is clearly changed, and not in a good way. He wears only peacekeeper clothes, improves his lying abilities, and is quick to draw his pulse pistol. He's more protective of his friends and scornful of Rigel, who betrayed them. At the end of Mind the Baby, John and Aaron are sitting snugly in Pilot's den. Aaron is optimistic, thinking perhaps that Crace has changed, like she did. Crichton is pessimistic and distrustful. He tried to make deals with Crace more than once and got screwed by him. He could have killed me, you know. He could have killed all of us, and he didn't. Yeah. Maybe just needed to save the energy for Starburst. Or maybe he's changed. <laughs> Well, you do believe people can change, don't you, John? (laughs) Well? (laughs) Well, uh, you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. But, Chris... With Scorpius still chasing them, the moon explosion was just a hurdle after all. Another round of the monomyth cycle begins. In season two, we'll discuss more about Crichton's supernatural aid, the wormhole knowledge the key to his return to Earth. We'll also look at more meetings with the goddess. And remember how gold can turn to ash? The hero's journey is an inward trek to fight the dragons within. Crichton's nemesis Scorpius is in his head, along with the key to make wormholes. In the larger meta-story of John Crichton, the initiation phase of the hero's journey has just begun. John Crichton would probably be the first to reject the idea he will be a hero, but he is on a hero's journey nevertheless. And whether he is hero material will be learned as his journey continues. 
Hey, you bastards. John Clayton was here. This is Hank Schiffman of the Skate Plus. You know, Kim, I really like how Wendy uses the hero legend to talk about John. Yeah, and the Bowie tune that they chose to accompany this, I think it really fits John's space oddity. It totally fits him. Yeah, he, he is kind of a space oddity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Wendy Hembrock with the news. Farscape will air in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. NBC's Universal Global Networks Deutschland will air the first 66 episodes. I hope they pick up Season 4 in the Peacekeeper Wars, because it's just cruel to stop at the end of Season 3. Farscape is planned to launch in the first quarter of 2007. ADV Films announced it is pressing new Starburst editions with single-sided four-disc versions, eliminating the double-sided DVDs completely. The new sets will be available in stores soon. Consumers who got defective two-sided Starburst DVDs can exchange them using a form on the ADV website. Since the Sci-Fi Channel announced it will not renew SG-1 for an 11th season, Stargate fans have started campaigns and organized their efforts on a website called, you guessed it, SaveStargateSG1.com. You can find details about the campaigns from letter writing and lobbying to drives to boost the ratings for the remaining Season 10 episodes. Season 10 is now available on iTunes for download as well. SG-1 cast members Ben Browder and Claudia Black have responded to the news that the show will not be renewed. Both were philosophical about the ending. Claudia remarked how she's been down this road before with that little show called Farscape, and Ben commented that he'll miss seeing the people he enjoys working with every day. Happy birthday to Jonathan Hardy on September 20th. Did you know he played the Man in the Moon in the film Moulin Rouge? And he played the Great Orlando in Ned Kelly? Send your scaper greetings to our favorite dominar. Gift baskets of chocolate would probably not go amiss. I wonder how many plush Rigels he'll receive. I want a Kit Kat and m and and raise his pieces. It's not easy being green and other things to consider. A book of inspirational quotes by Jim Henson and his characters and friends has been nominated as a finalist for the Quill Book Awards. The Quills are the only industry qualified book awards chosen by readers. The voting period runs through September 30th. So if you love the book and the inspiration of Jim Henson, make sure your vote is counted. Winners will be announced October 10th. Before he created Kermit, Miss Piggy, and the other Muppets, Jim Henson grew up in Hyattsville, Maryland, and attended the University of Maryland. To honor one of its most famous alumni, the university is presenting a day-long Henson celebration on September 22nd, featuring a panel with his widow, Jane Henson, discussing his legacy, a puppet show performance, and the opening of a new gallery exhibition covering Henson's career and innovations, behind-the-scenes photographs, and six Muppets. The exhibit will run through June of 2007. And now for the convention report. Gigi Edgeley will appear at Serenity 3 in London, England, September 15th through the 17th. VCon 31 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, October 6th through the 8th, will feature a Farscape fan table. The Farscape Burbank Convention, November 3rd through 5th, still has tickets available for the Sunday Breakfast and Charity Auction. And the band Signal Room, featuring Anthony Simcoe and Wayne Pygram, will give a performance. Ticket information will be available soon. Check the link in our show notes for details on any of the topics in today's show. I'm Wendy Hembrock for the Scapecast. Lindy, have you bought all of the new Starburst editions? 
you know, I, I haven't bought them yet, and I'm going to order them now. I'm much more interested now that I hear that ADV is putting them on single-sided DVDs. Yeah, I really like them, too. I like them for the extra cast commentaries. Um, I'm kind of a DVD junkie, and I'll watch the episodes, and then I jump right into the bonus features. That's what I do. Hi, I'm David Franklin, and you're listening to The Scapecast. It's your guide to the wonders of Farscape. Here's Nicola Wood with her interview of Gigi Edgeley, our favorite gray alien, Chiana. Hi, I'm Nicola Wood with the Scapecast, and we are sitting here with... Gigi Edgeley. <laughs> Hi, Gigi. Thank you for sparing some time with us. Thanks for having um, me. I wanted to ask you, where did you get your training? Like, what on earth inspired you to bring out this unusual character? Uh, Chiana was a complete blessing because she, uh, there were no rules to her. Mm-hmm. She's not from this world, so any dream, any imagining, any thought, any any moment that I've, I've experienced in my life or, or conjured up, I, I could put into this amazing creature. So um, I, through school and everything, I graduated from school and then I studied uh, acting for three years in Queensland University of Technology and... And it's a pretty intense course where you graduate, you graduate with English. Hopefully, you graduate with a, a Bachelor of Arts, and um, but there's a lot of practical work. So you do four hours of acting a day, and then you study with amazing people like the Boston, Boston Shakespeare and Company, and extraordinary tutors, and do dance and movement, and stage combat, and yoga, and singing, and all sorts of crazy stuff. And uh, every moment that I have spare all through my life I've never still to this day don't really know what I want to do but I know I love dressing up and playing make-believe and I know I love going on adventures and and it all seems to tie itself in together Mm -hmm. uh, by pursuing this this awesome this awesome career that I've I've, I've managed to uh, create so uh, how Chiana came about was yeah complete blessing and and I just I just fell into her really deep she's a very cool chick to play with you got to watch her, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do have a question about Chiana's contacts. Were they hard or soft? Did they bother uh, They were soft. Um, the only time we had challenges with the contacts were when uh, she went through her vision stages that with the, being blinded with the big, with the very large white ones, and they were full. They were full, covered up the whole half of your eye, whereas the little black ones were very easy in and out. And it's quite intense because you're wearing a lot of makeup around your eyes, and quite often they'd schedule a scene where you'd have your black contacts in, and then they'd cut to another scene with your white ones in. And after about three or four times of taking them in and out with the makeup, it got a little challenging sometimes to mm-hmm. keep one's eye open. <laughs> but um, that was sort of that was not too challenging in the grand sort of scheme of things whereas the cat's eyes on peacekeeper walls were uh, very challenging they would rotate a lot and uh, I think um, yeah it was a very interesting learning experience to to uh, challenge yourself with such a physical um, learning experience <laughs> to put it politely they did get it was quite frustrating because I found them very hard to um, relate to or to connect with when I was doing the work and stuff in the mirror and trying to find out you know, how we're going to play a scene. It's intriguing to realise how much the windows are literally, uh, the eyes are literally the windows to the soul. And when one's rotating anti-clockwise, it's a bit odd. <laughs> Tell me about Last Train to Frio. Last Train to last t- like just said Last Train. <laughs> last Train to Frio is... Uh, a film I just finished and just recently we heard that it got accepted into the Australian Film Institute uh, which is regarded as the Australian's highest awards um, which is very fantastic and uh, it opened in Melbourne a couple of nights ago and uh, it's a feature film with five cast members in it and it's almost like you're watching a piece of theatre it's uh, you follow these ca- characters on a train journey into the darkest night and it's a yeah, intriguing film I'm very very proud of it and I'm about to jump on a plane in a couple of weeks to go and promote it back home which is very exciting Had you worked with any of the other actors from uh, Strain before? No so it's a brand new experience. Yeah absolutely very challenging and 
and it was the kind of production of all all the um, productions and uh, that I'm working on now or from here on in I'm making a very conscious effort to be really passionate about the the message that it's sending out and what kind of message that is because uh, I see on TV and just moved to Los Angeles and you I read a lot of scripts and a lot of uh, you know you see a lot of programs that it's like fast food it's not you're not learning anything from it and it's not inspiring anyone and I think mm, being so blessed to be a storyteller I want to tell good stories well that was what Tarskip was it's yeah a good story. Yeah, great character. territories. Yes. <laughs> Did you do you prefer stage work or film? I love it all. Anything that I can I can fall into and learn from is is very is very cool for me. Uh, I, I think the awesome thing about theatre is that you have to um, just be completely aware of the complicity that you have with the actors on stage and with your audience. And it's it's so s- spontaneous and so in the moment because you can feel when a production isn't being well received, you know, and you, you have to alter right then and there, and 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 be very conscious of, of um, the performance you're giving that night and try and make it as less performance as possible and more more into the storytelling side of things, and more to like telling, you know, showing a slice of life as opposed to performing in the theatre you know you bump into a lot of those kind of actors which is very cool and very classic and and very um um you know beautiful in its in its own right but um I just uh I think it was last year maybe two years ago did this awesome stage production called 448 Psychosis and it was about uh Sarah Kane this extraordinary woman who was the first woman that was accepted into the royal court at the age of 23. Her work was accepted into the royal court and she wrote this particular piece and suicided as soon as she released it. So for a very long time they wouldn't release it because they didn't know where it was a suicide note and you know what kind of tone would be attached to this production. And it was just magical and really awesome to fall into uh, a soul's heart and mind and and life for sort of I think we worked on it for about three months and really fall into her pool of of questions about life and everything about it it was a very challenging piece very exciting Um, could you tell us a little bit more about Sarah Kane the the person so that we give background to some of these uh, Sarah Kane, Sarah Kane. All I, I I know is that she's. I've read a few of her pieces. I've ne- I've never actually seen any of them, uh, and it's about. From what I understand, my from my perception, it was a little girl or a soul that was just searching for love, like we all are, mm-hmm. and in c- completely in tune, so in tune that people thought she was mad. <laughs> Sure, we can all relate to that at some times. <laughs> On occasion, yes. Um, what are your favourite films, and what kind of films would you like to be doing? Um, my favourite films are any films a good film, um, even the ones that I think are a bit dodgy. Sometimes you learn even more from those ones because it kind of inspires you in a way. You go, oh, I can do this, and I can. I've got a story that I can tell, and it's valid and and uh, and and worth hearing. Um, but I love City of Lost Children. I love Memento. I love like Chocolate for Water. I love um, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Um, L.A. Confidential is another good one. Um, and I would like to be uh, m- making films that have a great script. Any, just as long as they've got a really good story, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's dark or if it's light, if it's comedy, or just a really good story to tell. Because yeah. life's too short not to. It is. What kind of character would you like to play in the future? Anything in particular? Uh, I, I, oh, wow. Once again, just any it, uh, really... I just really want to focus on characters and stories that that enlighten me in some way, mm-hmm. you know. Because uh, I, you read a lot of work that's you kind of wonder how it got to manifest, and and it's all good, but it's just not the kind of resonance that I want to be cruising at at the moment. 
and I just uh, flew myself back to Australia for uh, to audition for this script that I'm very much in love with, which is hopefully going to be bubbling sometime next year. And you know it when you see it. it it'll be it'll be bellissimo, <laughs> beautiful, bellissimo, edible, yum. <laughs> You're not going to tell us anything more nope. about it. <laughs> Oh, Gigi is so awesome. I just love her. Um, and she and David at Comic-Con recognized my costume that I wore to Comic-Con on Saturday. And I know you went as Aaron, but it wasn't really Aaron, was it? Well, technically, I was John as Aaron from the episode Out of Their Minds. I put my hair up in Aaron's uh, battle pony. I made a green zip-up shirt. I wore black military trousers my big badass peacekeeper boots and a pulse pistol and a holster complete with a photo of John Crichton around my neck. And you did look pretty darn adorable. (laughs) Oh, thank you. It was fun. I was so nervous about it, but it was fun. Well, there you are driving home with a friend. You're coming back from doing a good thing. You volunteered at a soup kitchen and kablam. Some schmuck runs the red light, plows into your car, and poof, that's it. Fade to black. You're deader than disco. But you're a good person. You know that. So you know that your adventure is just beginning. You've earned the eternal reward. Heaven. But what if your heaven wasn't so heavenly? All sizzle and no steak. A non-corporeal conspiracy of sorts. A never-ending bummer that'd be downright blasphemous if it weren't true. Heaven kinda sucks. Could you stand it? If you couldn't, would you leave? Discover other places? What about other heavens? That's what happened to longtime friends Kate and Daniel. And that's what they're doing. They're traveling to heavens of cultures now. Of yore. Of other species. There are loves and secrets. The roads are everlasting. Explore the heavens. Find Mer Lafferty's Heaven at PatioBooks.com. And next up, our next segment is the Nabari Murder Mystery, written by Nicola Wood. The Nobari Murder Mystery Welcome to the program that examines the puzzle of who killed Salas in the episode Durka Returns. A quick word of explanation. Salas was an unpleasant Nobari who was taking Chiana back to Nobari Prime to be mind cleansed when his vessel collided with Moya and he, Chiana, and Salas's associate Durka were forced to take refuge aboard while repairs to his vessel were attempted. Salas made quite an impression upon the crew of Moya, and his death was the first real indication that the encounter with the Nabari vessel had escalated beyond unfortunate and into acute danger. But for all the excitement that Salas's death presaged, in the final analysis it becomes clear that his murderer was never identified. Yes, There is speculation and assumptions based on that speculation, but the audience is never given a final and definitive answer. So tonight we are going to examine the question of who done it? Who killed the Nabari? Chiana is the obvious suspect. She has the most history with the victim, the most to gain from his death, and the least to lose. Jana is desperate to free herself from Nabari custody, as the prospect of mind cleansing into an obedient zombie is terrifying. So much so that she tells Crichton, "I'd rather be dead." And I find no reason to disbelieve her. The last time we see Salas alive, he is looking towards, presumably, his murderer with a look of mild inquiry, as though he had nothing to fear from whoever was approaching him. Salas is aware that Chiana can be violent, and he did tell Durka to warn everyone that she was capable of violence. In addition, he knows that she would do anything to get free, so his passive stance suggests that it was not Chiana who was approaching him. 
Besides, Gianna was not even able to overcome John in the physical confrontation, and that is when she had the drop on him and was armed with that peculiar ore tool thing to boot. And even after Chan is free, for now, from the Nabari threat, she still refuses to give a straight answer to Crichton when he asks, Where were you when Salas was murdered? Chiana does not confirm or deny the possibility that she might be responsible for Salas's death, but I am not convinced that Chiana is the killer. The reason Chiana did not answer Crichton was because she did not know the answer, but Chiana left her response ambiguous enough because if the crew thought she was capable of that kind of violence, then perhaps they would respect her. In her world, the kind of life that she has been living, the only thing that's worth gaining from others is respect. It gets you a measure of safety, a measure of freedom, and maybe even access to your next meal. So no, Jana would not deny responsibility, but she would not accept it either. Although I will say that Salas was one sorry excuse for a sentient being, and it would not have bothered me a bit if she had been the individual who had offed him. So who does that leave? Durka, of course, and the rest of the crew who are possibilities. It quite possibly could have been Durka. Durka definitely had the motive, and certainly the ability. Plus, Salas was stabbed, and the only person with a knife that we saw was Durka. Well, to clarify... Aaron did take a knife from Rigel, but I am confident that it was not Aaron who did in Salas. However, when Aaron asked Durka if he was responsible for the murder, he did not answer. Durka just paused and then looked away. Aaron took that as confirmation, as he intended, I am sure, and warned John. But if Durka had murdered Salas, he would have claimed the kill. Durka was, at that point, in control of Moya. He had two hostages as guarantees, and he had nothing to lose by admitting to murder. Plus, he did have something to gain. Admitting to a savage, cold-blooded murder might have given him an edge when psychologically terrorizing the crew. Yes, the old Durka is back. I murder without compunction and maim and torture. Bwah ha ha I think he would have claimed the kill if he had made it. By not claiming the kill, he let those who did not know who did it assume he was the killer, and allow him the psychological advantage, without leaving himself open to direct contradiction from the real killer, and thereby weakening his position. If you followed that last sentence, I am impressed. I wrote it, and I get confused. Moya, Pilot, and the DRDs are also suspects. But Salas was not the threat to the Leviathan that Durka turned out to be, and the DRDs did not kill Durka. I think we can eliminate Rigel and Aaron. They were together during the relevant time period, and I highly doubt that either one would have wanted to kill Salas at that moment. Durka, yes. Salas, no. Or would have allowed the other to do so without some kind of significant bonding interaction, and we saw no evidence of that either before or or after. Dargo was in the maintenance bay the whole time, at least that is what we were shown, and he never budged from his position covering the entrance with his qualta blade. Besides, Dargo definitely does not want to annoy the Nanabari cruiser that is coming to rendezvous with Durka, Salas, and Chiana. It would be out of character for Crichton to do it, although it is possible that he is starting to think it might be a good idea. While Crichton has changed a great deal since he has arrived in the uncharted territories, I do not think he has changed that much. Even in that old black magic, when Crichton finally did decide to fight Kreis, it was only after much goading, rejected attempts to negotiate, and betrayal that he was pushed to the edge. I do not think he would endanger the crew just to save Chiana without talking to the rest of the group first. In addition, he did not know that Durka was not as cleansed as he used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bari mental cleansing doesn't get the tough stains out. And therefore, he would have had to neutralize Durka as well. As far as we know, Crichton, and indeed none of the crew, made any move to do any such thing. So who is left? Zan. Why do I think that Zan is the best candidate for the part of murderer in this episode of Durka Returns? Zan has murdered before. Of all the crew that was imprisoned by the peacekeepers on Moya, Zan is the only one who is actually guilty of the crime for which she was jailed. You killed the guy you were having sex with, Zan! Zan murdered her lover in the most intimate of circumstances. 
and it drove her mad. John, before I became a priest, I, I was a savage. Yeah, I think I remember you saying that. I don't, don't know that I ever believed it. You've never seen that part of me. I thought I'd eradicated it forever. Eradicated it? No. Zan just walled it away, thinking she defeated the beast. But when she found it necessary, she reawakened her evil by just reaching down to pull it up. She did it to defeat Maldus and save Crichton, her shipmates, and the population of the planet they were visiting. A worthy goal, but one that left her with a very big problem. The evil she awakened will not easily vanish. I feel it inside me still. Now I have to rid myself of it again. And I don't know if I can do it, John. Well, is there anything I can do to help? No one can help me. I'm sorry. Her apology to Crichton does not erase reality. It took 17 cycles for Zan to wall that beast up the first time, and she never did learn how to control it. Even after she became a 10th level Pau, Zan said, The vestments of a Pau. Feels like a shroud I'm no longer worthy. And she walks away from the Delvian Seek. So we know that Zan is capable of murder. Now we need to look at motive. Why would Zan kill Salas? Zan is very distressed by the concept of mental cleansing. She is the one character that pursues the issue repeatedly, both with Salas and Durka, and is extremely agitated by the concept. In Rhapsody in Blue, Zan was very displeased with the mind meddling that Talene and her cohorts practiced on her shipmates. Indeed, Zan was planning to murder Talene in retribution for the betrayal of trust that Talene had committed. Crichton prevented that particular kill, but we know that Zan's dark impulses are still running amok. The conversation that Zan and Salas had in the galley when Zan was asking about mental cleansing went as follows. The Nabari practiced mind control? We simply eliminated those thought patterns that led him to behave inappropriately. Eliminated? A process of neural realignment so intricate that each subject must be placed under cryonic suspension for nearly 100 cycles. And what does each subject feel during this? This treatment. Wasn't this exactly what Zan thought she had done during her 17 cycles of meditation? Eliminate the evil within her soul? And wasn't she so very, very wrong? In addition, this mental cleansing of the Nabari would seem to her to be a terrible violation of personal integrity, an external imposition of control rather than an organic growth of maturity and personal quest to transcend the darkness within. Zan is also aware the capabilities of the standard Nabari host vessel that engaged and defeated a fully armed and state-of-the-art 100 cycles ago peacekeeper vessel, the Zelbinian. Moya is unarmed and without defenses except for half of a patched-in defense shield that did not save the Zelbinian. As well, the vessel that Salas, Durka, and Chiana arrived on is equipped with a massive energy weapon. Powered right down for the moment. It would not help to just overpower Salas and put him back on board his ship to await Nabari rescue. He has the capability and would have the motivation to take out Moya and her crew without any difficulty. So from Zan's perspective, he really needs to be taken care of permanently. So much for motive. Now let's consider method and opportunity. Salas as I mentioned before, was stabbed. The scene before Salas encounters his murderer, we see Zan searching alone in the galley, presumably for Chiana. There are knives in the galley. The very next scene is Salas looking towards his murderer with a look of mild inquiry, which is exactly the same way he was looking at Zan when she was asking about Nabari mind cleansing. But the clincher for me is this scene that occurred after Rigel's abortive attempt to kill Durka. You will, of course, turn him over to me when the host ship arrives. I will do nothing of the sort. There are many aspects of your character that would benefit from adjustment. And Zan proves that point by moving aggressively towards him. My point exactly. Salas threatened both Rigel and Zan herself with Nabari mind cleansing. We know that Zan killed her lover and help disperse Maldis to protect those she cares about. Consequently, I think it was Zan 
who recognized a more serious threat and dealt with it accordingly. Zhang can be very pragmatic when she wants to be. Witness her assistance with the amputation of Pilot's arm in DNA Mad Scientist. So, there you go. The part of this episode's murderer was played by Zan, at least in my version of the Nabari murder mystery. Attention, there are opportunities all around you. Opportunities to help spread the scaper word around the world. The Scapecast Beacon, a call to all scapers to mobilize. Oscape 2, a Farscape convention being held in Sydney, Australia, needs people to buy their tickets soon. If they don't sell enough tickets by December, they will have to cancel the convention. Calling all banner artists. Aaron Crichton on Terra Firma is putting out an urgent appeal for creative folks to design banners for the television without pity Farscape recaps. Farscape Canada is currently fundraising to help the Toronto Public Library get four copies of all four seasons on their shelves. They're selling DVDs of Farscape to help raise the funds. There is a new Claudia Black Portal website up and the hosts are looking for contributors to submit articles, pictures, reviews, and video clips. Check our show notes for more information. This has been the Scapecast Beacon, a call to all scapers to mobilize. Hi, I'm David Franklin, and if you want any information about myself or many members of the cast, go to peachtreeservices.net. You'll find out where we're appearing and what's going on. Hey, wait, I got a couple of questions. A couple of thousand more questions. Question, 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 question of the week. This week's question for the question of the week is, how do you use Farscape words in everyday life? Piper Chick from South Carolina posts, When I started using Frel, my friends and family just gave me looks, but now since I say it so often, they don't bat an eye. My younger brother is starting to use Frel and other Farscape lingo, and let's just say his teacher is less than happy. I also called my car a piece of frelling dren the other day, and the guy next to me asked where I was from, almost tempted me to say the uncharted territories. Most times I don't realize I'm using Farscape words, it just happens. My mom is now thinking of making frel the equivalent to the real word at home, so my siblings can't say it anymore. Gotta love Farscape for finding loopholes in every aspect of life. My name is Jeff Rapp, and, um... I'm a travel consultant, travel agent uh, in international travel, and what I often do lately is I use a couple of phrases whenever uh, a client really, really, really likes to go someplace and there is nothing to be had to give the client there, and I'm trying to think of a way to break the bad news to the client and go, well... Things are looking mighty grim in Mudville, or uh, alternately, Whoville. <laughs> of course, I get some strange looks from my uh, colleagues when I say that, but, uh, but it gets the, uh, the thought across. Okay, thanks for doing such a great job with the skate cast. Rock out. Bye. Selm from Brisbane, Australia says, I use frel a bit, especially now that I have littlies. I think I'd much rather they learn that than the alternative. I also manage to slip Dren and Hesmana into conversation sometimes, too. We used to yell, my side, your side, my side, your side, out car windows at people who have trouble driving in their lane, which seems to happen a lot around here lately. I've never said Lumas or Ema, but then I don't want to look like a total freak. Hi, this is Lisa from Indianapolis, and I'm very much enjoying the skatecast. I wanted to answer the question of the week. Uh, Although I am a big sci-fi fan, people who know me in my professional life as a consultant or my other life as a yoga teacher often don't know that about me. And so when I walked into a colleague's office one day and said that something had been frilled up, he looked at me incredulously. Do you get the sci-fi channel, he asked me? Well, of course I do. He said, do you watch Farscape? Clearly he hadn't been to my office where the Save Farscape poster was up on my bulletin board. Uh, 
from that day forward, not only did we become friends, but I had much less trouble with his department throwing things up. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Well, I use a lot of Farscape words in everyday life, but I mostly use them as swear words, because it's the only way to get away with swearing in the office when things in, at work get a little bit stressed. Um, I use Frel and I use Duran quite a bit, but I've used them so much I'm pretty sure my co-workers already know what they're meant to mean, so I might have to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, you're at the edge of the envelope there, but... I know that the one that is said a lot by everyone here in my house is, "Get, let's get the hismana out of here. Hismana, we just love that word. Well, everybody, you know that Kurt and Kevin are not here because they're off playing at Dragon Con. So this week, I get to ask the question of the week. So for our next episode, this is the question you need to answer. What Farscape character is most like you and why? Hmm, that's an easy one for me. <laughs> okay, well, we'll be listening for next time. Hey, welcome back. I asked you what real human icon was used for the peacekeeper symbol. Well, that same red triangle piercing the circle was first used in the early 20th century by the communist forces in the Russian Revolution. Its actual title is Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge, and it was designed by the Russian L. Lizitsky. Did you know the answer? Hey, there's always next time. For the Scapecast, I'm Brent Barrett. This episode has been brought to you by the word probacto. Now, quit being one and leave me alone. Well, Kim, Lindy, we've reached... (laughs) We have reached the end of another great episode of the Scapecast. I have really enjoyed hearing part two of our John character review. Yeah, and that's only for season one. We still have three more seasons and a miniseries to go through. And I also want to thank Nicola for the murder mystery segment and the fabulous interview that she had with Gigi. Yeah, and I sure hope that everyone in Ema's world calms down soon. I really don't want to have to go through those voicemails again. And finally, I want to say congratulations to us, the Scapegast crew, for our Parsec Award. These are annual awards, and we have the very first one for fan base podcasts. It does take a team, and we have a great one. Yeah, we sure do. And for some of us, this is our first experience podcasting. Yeah, get an old creation and do that. And again, I want to say thank you to my lovely and talented partner for today, Kimberly Thompson. Thank you so much for sitting in for Kevin. I really have enjoyed having you here as my co-host. And I think you've done a really great job. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us as we continue our journey. I'm Kimberly sitting in for Kevin. And I'm Lindy. Now it's time to disable your comms and find new wonders until next time. This is John Crichton, somewhere in the universe. You've been listening to Escapecast, episode 11, produced September 2006. Writers for this episode were Lindy Ray, Kimberly Thompson, Nicola Wood, Brent Barrett, Wendy Hambrock, and Kurt Armbruster. This episode featured voice performances by Lindy Ray, Kimberly Thompson, Kevin Batchel, Kurt Armbruster, Brent Barrett, Hank Schiffman, Ken Chapinia, Nicola Wood, Wendy Hambrock. For the entire Scapecast crew, I'm Sammy Moore. Thanks for listening, and fly safe. Actually not next week. I'll be back on the little more... Oh, Jesus. Sorry, Sammy. Let's try this again. (laughs) 